Well, the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost, Amen. So today, the feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary it is really perhaps one of the mysterious feasts of this century that became a, a, a promulgated to the Universal Church and made a greater feast in 1942 by Pope Pius XII during the middle of World War II. And Pope Pius XII was consecrated a bishop on May, May the 13th, 1917. And later on, when he learned about Fatima, when he was already a cardinal, we discovered that the first day of the apparition of Our Lady was May the 13th, 1917, the same day that he was consecrated a bishop. And when he became Pope, he considered himself the Pope of Fatima. Because of that, he considered that it was not a coincidence that he was made a bishop on the very same day that Our Lady appeared in Fatima, Portugal, when of course he had no knowledge about the apparition of Our Lady. And he was the first one to call himself the Pope of Fatima. And he knew about the desire of the Blessed Virgin Mary that Russia be consecrated to the Immaculate Heart. And in World War II, it was rage, raging very violently in the middle of 1942. And the Germans were winning the war, or so it seemed. And the Russians were now, with the, with the, with the Russians had switched sides, and things looked complicated. And he was afraid to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart. But he wanted to fulfill the request of Our Lady of Fatima. And so he made this feast, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, he expanded it. Of course, there was already a feast in some places, but he expanded the feast, made it a universal feast, and then he consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But he did not fulfill the request of Our Lady. And when he expanded the feast, he did make it a feast, but it was a second-class feast and not a first-class feast. And when we read in the breviary about this feast, there's no mention of Fatima in the course of the reading of the promulgation of this feast. Only the beauty of the Immaculate Heart. And so it was a kind of a weak gesture of the Pope, who was the first one to call himself the Pope of Fatima, to try to fulfill the request of Mary, but in a half-hearted way. And in the 80s, John Paul II would in a half-hearted way also try to fulfill the request of Our Lady of Fatima, but neither of them fulfilled her request. And so it is in many ways, though it is a great feast, the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the circumstances of the creation of this feast are mysterious. Because if the Pope Pius XII, who called himself the Pope of Fatima, had he consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart, then Russia would not have been the great victor of World War II. It's described very well in the book of the Whole Truth About Fatima, Volume 2, by, uh, Father, by Brother Michael of the Holy Trinity, so he says, if you look at the war called World War II, the victor was Russia. The victor was communism. And the war was a war about communism. And the end of that war was the spreading of communism throughout the whole world. And perhaps the one that could be blamed was Pius XII. Because he did not fulfill the request of Our Lady. He did a half-hearted fulfilling of it. And we have some beautiful words of St. Bernardine of Siena, which are put into the breviary today on this Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, when it says, Consider the heart of Mary. And it begins by saying, We envy St. John. For St. John put his head on the heart of Christ during the Last Supper. And then, only a few hours later, after having his head upon the heart of Christ, he stood at the foot of the cross, and our Lord Jesus Christ gave Mary into his home. And he would live with the Blessed Virgin Mary in his heart, in his home. And he who was the beloved disciple would have his head upon the heart of Christ, and his heart united to the heart of Mary. And then the words of Mary. Seven words that came from her heart. If you look at sacred scripture, you will find seven words that come from the heart of Mary. St. Bernardine, Bernardine of Siena speaks of these seven words. Consider who Mary speaks to, says St. Bernardine. He speaks twice to an angel. First, her speech. She speaks twice to an angel. She speaks twice to her cousin Elizabeth. She speaks twice to our Lord Jesus Christ. And she speaks once to us and to the attendants. These are her seven words. And these are the words of women 
who wish to be followers of Christ and imitators of Mary. They should have words that go to the angels, words that go to the Son, words that go to the attendants, and these were words, of course, to the neighbor Elizabeth. And notice when she speaks to Elizabeth, all of her words are short, says St. Bernardine, except for one word. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, the Magnificat. And this word that is long is the only word that should be long in the mouth of a woman, says St. Bernardine. And that is the praise of God. That when she is speaking to Elizabeth, she says briefly, hello to Elizabeth. That's her first word. And then Elizabeth responds, how is it the mother of my Lord should come unto me? And all women that imitate the heart of Mary should have words that come from their heart and they should be like unto the heart of the Blessed Virgin. Notice this, say the saints, when Mary said hello, when Mary said the words of greeting, which are the common words that every woman speaks, when she said those words, Elizabeth did not hear the words. Elizabeth heard Christ. Elizabeth heard behind the words of Mary and inside of the heart of Mary and inside of the womb of Mary was our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore she responded, How is it that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? And whenever women who are imitators of the Blessed Virgin travel throughout the world and greet others, when they speak to others, when they say hello to others, when they open their mouth to others, this opening of the mouth should be a calling to the souls and a, 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 a making echoing to the souls the voice of Christ inside of them. That there's something inside of them when they say hello. There's someone living inside of them. Now this cannot be done, says St. Bernardine, unless we first speak to angels. A woman must regularly speak to the angels. Her first word to the angel was, How can this be, such as I do not know man? And St. Augustine tells us, This is the word of ignorance. It is the word by which the Blessed Virgin Mary says, She is ignorant of sin. She is ignorant of vice. She is ignorant of evil. She does not know man. And because she is ignorant of sin, because she is ignorant of vice, and she has a pure heart, then when the angel asks her to be the mother of God, she is able to say, Fiat mici secundum verbum tuum. Her second word to the angel. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. These are the kinds of words that must come from women who are the daughters of Mary. When Eve spoke, these kind of words did not come forth. Therefore Mary had to sanctify the words. And they are all words that flow from her heart. This heart is the heart that will conquer the devil. This is the heart that will triumph. The immaculate heart of Mary. One reason perhaps why Pope Pius XII put the feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary on this August 22nd. It is the octave day of the Feast of the Assumption. Assumption. On the Feast of the Assumption we celebrate the victory of Mary. And the victory of Christ which is completed in the victory of Mary. When she crushes the head of the serpent completely and her body and soul are in heaven and she takes her place as the queen of heaven and takes her place in the complete dominion of the devil. And maybe one reason why Pius XII chose this feast to be here on the 22nd of August in the octave day was a kind of a subtle reminder to the world because he was afraid to speak it explicitly though he called himself the Pope of Fatima. The admission to the world that the Mary's immaculate heart will crush the head of the serpent. And the Immaculate Heart of Mary shall be the final victory. It will be a victory of her heart. And maybe this is one reason why this octave day of the Assumption is made the day of the Universal Feast by Pope Pius XII of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And we must consecrate not only the world to the Immaculate Heart, Russia must be consecrated to the Immaculate Heart. And we must be imitators of the Immaculate Heart. And so today is a great feast but one that is mysterious, because had Pope Pius XII really fulfilled the request of Fatima, whom he claimed to be the Pope of, had he really done it, the horrors of World War II would have come to an end, and the victory would have come at that time. But perhaps one reason why it didn't happen, was referred to in the book of Gideon, or the, in, the, in the story of Gideon, in the book of Judges, where God says to Gideon, gather together an army to fight against the enemies of God. 
the Hittites, or, or not the Hittites, whatever, whichever ones they were, the bad guys, the Amorites, fighting against the enemies of God. And 30, 60,000, I think it was 30,000 that came first. 30,000 men came. And they were going to fight 60 or 90,000 of the enemy. And God said to Gideon, too many are there. There are too many. For even though I will give the victory, if these 30,000 fight, they will think that they won by their own power. Therefore, tell those that are afraid to go home. And Gideon said, those that are afraid, go home. And 20,000 went home. Bishop Sheen points out from that, the math of Scripture. He says, we know from the math of Scripture that at least two out of three that say they fight for Christ are cowards. 20,000 went home, 10,000 remained. And then he went back to God. And our Lord God said to Gideon, there are still too many. There are too many. For even with 10,000, if you fight against 60,000, by human means you can still win. And I want it to be very clear that only I gave the victory. Therefore, tell them to go down to the water and drink. Those who kneel down and take water into their hand, from their hands and put it into their mouth, let them go to one side. Those who lay on their bellies and take the water on their mouth in this way, let them go to the other side. And 9,700 laid on their bellies. And 300 knelt down and put the hand to their mouth. And then God told Gideon, send the 9,700 home. Oh, with these 300 alone, I will destroy the enemies of God. And all will know that I have given the victory and it was not man. But before the 9,700 go, tell them that they must give to the 300 the weapons for battle. And there were three weapons that they carried into battle. The trumpet. Anyone that had a trumpet must hand their trumpet to the 300 soldiers. An empty bucket. An empty clay pot. Those who had empty clay water pots handed to the 300 soldiers. And then a lantern with fire. And they had 300 lanterns, 300 empty pots, and 300 uh, trumpets. With these weapons you will destroy the Amorites. With these weapons you will destroy the enemies of God. And then in the middle of the night they went to the camp. And in the middle of the night Gideon told them, What I do, you do. And Gideon first took out the trumpet and he blew the trumpet. And when he blew the trumpet, the other 299, they blew their trumpets. Or the 300 blew their trumpets. And when the Amorites heard the sound of the trumpets, they thought a great army was upon them. And so they came out in the middle of the night with their swords. And all they saw was the others. And so they began to kill each other, thinking that it was the enemy. And then Gideon took his clay pot, and he dropped it on the ground and broke it. And he held up his lantern. And the other 300 took their clay pots and threw them on the ground and held up their lanterns. And then there was a great light. And then the soldiers thought for sure a great army was upon them, and they continued to slay each other. Not one of Gideon's army was harmed, and the enemy was destroyed by a trumpet, by an empty clay pot, and by a fire. And this was done to show that in certain battles, God wants to make it perfectly clear that there is only divine victory. And let no man think that Gideon was a great soldier. And to make it clear that Gideon was not a great soldier, in this very beginning of Gideon, Gideon was asked to be a soldier of God. And he said, can you give the job to someone else? He was like Moses. He didn't want the job. Then he asked God, asked Gideon to give a sign. And Gideon asked for one sign. May all the dew fall on the ground, but not on me. And he gave that sign. And one night, he said, well, I don't like that sign. Give me another sign. The next night, make the dew fall on me and the rest of the ground be dry. And he gave him that sign. And finally Gideon agreed to follow God. An unwilling commander and a weak commander. And a weak army. The Blessed Virgin Mary would give, the, our Lord Jesus Christ would give the victory. And so likewise, maybe one of the mysteries of the Pope Pius XII, the Pope of Fatima, he did not consecrate Russia. He was weak. And maybe it was not the will of Our Lady that it be consecrated at that time because the church seemed too strong at that time. It seemed like the good old days. And we would think perhaps the enemies of God were conquered because of the holy priests in the 50s and because of the great number of vocations after World War II and because of all the power of the church which was still in its visible glory at that time. And maybe one reason why that consecration didn't happen is because Our Lady wanted to make it very clear, like in the time of Gideon, that only heaven will bring the victory. And so we must remember in our time of great crisis... One day the Pope will consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And very, it's very likely that it may be like that in the case of Pius XII, 
who was afraid to make the consecration, but because of the middle of the war, and because the war did not seem to be going well, and because he was confused, and out of fear more than anything else, he made a weak consecration. And maybe it will happen again, that there will be another war, a world war, and a great crisis, and bloodshed all over the world. And then in the midst of the bloodshed, the Pope, out of fear, and the Pope, because of not seeing any other way out, at the last moment, will consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And then will come the great victory, which will be from heaven and not from earth. And between now and then, we just remain faithful to Our Lady and keep our hearts united to the heart of Mary and the heart of Christ. And then lastly, as Father Urban used to say many times when he was getting Alzheimer's, and we give the same sermon every week, and would not remember that he was giving the same sermon every week. But he used to say at the end of his sermons frequently as he was dying of Alzheimer's, remember to keep your eye on heaven as the end and goal of life. There is even a place in purgatory for those that have not, not, not desired heaven enough. But if you want to go to heaven, then you must love the heart of Jesus Christ. But no one can love his heart as it needs to be loved or should be loved in a worthy way except for the Blessed Virgin Mary. And therefore, ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to give you her heart with which to love her son. But no one can love Mary as she deserves to be loved except for her son. And therefore, ask her son to give you her heart with which to love his mother. And with these two hearts, we are guaranteed heaven. <laughs> And Father Urban used to repeat those words every week for many weeks, not realizing that he had done so the week before and the week before and the week before. But we must unite ourselves to the heart of Mary, the heart of Christ. And as the example of St. Bernardine says, look at the great glory of John. Who cannot envy St. John? He who put his head upon the heart of Christ at the Last Supper just before he went to do the greatest act of the divine love, which was to save our souls by his death, and then he lived with the heart of Mary for the next 15 years and took the heart of Mary into his own house. And so no wonder he is the beloved disciple. No wonder he is the greatest of the priests and the most chosen one of Jesus Christ. And so in our end times, it is more important to be like St. John than to be like St. Peter. More important to be a lover of the two hearts, united to these two hearts, United to these two hearts, God will then give us the strength to persevere through the crisis that is coming upon us. And then eventually, the Pope will obey the request of Our Lady, and when it is late, as Our Lady of Fatima said it would be, to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And this second class feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary will become the greatest feast of the end times. I'm going to close with that. God bless you all. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.